Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Gross. Some of you know me, you've seen me before, either in person or on, on your screen. Um, I'm a senior fellow here at the Begin Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening for what is actually our fifth lecture in this Mr. Prime Minister series. Our last one on Golda Meir was actually several months ago here at the center, and some of you I know uh, were here for that and for those that seeded it. And now that we're doing this over Zoom, we can welcome many other people uh, from further afield to these lectures. I know that some of you were also here for other lectures that we've been doing online, uh, for lectures that I've been doing and, and with guests, uh, such as last week's with uh, Dan Murray Dorr. So it's great to see you here for this as well. And um, we're going to be continuing with this series of Mr. Prime Minister uh, for the next five weeks. Uh, and after that, we'll be continuing uh, English language programming at this slot um, on a Wednesday every week. So everyone who registered for this event will receive an update about next week's and we'll continue updating you as the, as the weeks go on. Um, okay, for those of you that are new to these Zoom lectures, I'll just explain how it's gonna work in terms of um, Q&A. After our speaker has, uh, has, has spoken, we'll be taking questions in writing. You can ask those questions in the chat box. Um, there's the chat button at the bottom of your screen uh, and I'll be reading out questions to our guest at the end of his presentation. Okay, so to today's lecture. Firstly, I should say, I should say, especially those of you that may have noticed the chronology, we've digressed a little bit from the strict chronology of prime ministers. Um, as I said, Golda Meir was our last lecture and she was in fact succeeded by by Yitzhak Rabin as Prime Minister, and we'll be hearing about Rabin next week. Um, the switch is actually for logistical reasons, but actually, as it happens, I think there's something um, uh, appropriate uh, that we restart this series after such a long break by hearing about the Prime Minister who, whose name and legacy this uh, institution, uh, where I'm sitting, was established to preserve. So, uh, to tell us about Menachem Begin, we are extremely fortunate and privileged to have with us not only the author of an acclaimed biography of Begin, but really uh, one of the outstanding English speaking writers, thinkers and educators that we have with us here in Israel. He's also a very good friend of the Begin Center, um, Dr. Daniel Gordis, the Senior Vice President and Correct Distinguished Fellow at Shalem College, um, previously Vice President of the Mandel Foundation in Israel and Director of its Leadership Institute. Uh, he is the author of 12 books, including the aforementioned biography of Menachem Begin, a regular columnist for Bloomberg View, frequent contributor to many other news outlets, um, and lectures throughout the world, probably a little less at the moment, but lectures throughout the world on Israeli society, American-Israeli relations, and the challenges facing the Jewish state. He's a two-time winner of the National Jewish Book Award, and his most recent book is the uh, uh, outstanding We Stand Divided, The Rift Between American Jews and Israel, published last year, which I uh, strongly recommend. Okay, um, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Daniel Gordis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, very, very much. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, just a delight to, to be here and to have everyone on board. I want to thank you for joining. Um, Paul said that I've uh, been a, become a good friend of the Begin Center. I actually think the Begin Center has been a very good friend to me. Uh, when I was working on the book, uh, the archives of the Begin Center and the experts at the Begin Center really could not have been more helpful. So uh, I am very grateful to all of them, and it's a pleasure to join uh, with them once again in uh, a series of lectures devoted to the prime ministers, and of course, for me to do the one about Menachem Begin. Uh, what I'm going to do, just to give you an idea of how we're going to do this, I am going to kind of take us through the history of Begin's life. We're going to do this in a biographical, chronological way to start with, but as I go through through, and I'm certainly obviously going to have to skip certain things because it's the nature of the beast that uh, we're not going to be able to get to everything. But I am going to point out as we go through certain things that we should look at for how they play out a little bit later in his life, certain themes uh, that you'll see. So for the first part of this, I'm actually going to share a screen so you'll have in front of you a few PowerPoint screens about his life. Um, then I want to, after we've gone through the whole biography, which will take us maybe about a half an hour, a little bit longer than that want to try to summarize a little bit some things about Begin in general and ask really why he is actually so revered by right and left these days. And if you find that peculiar and say, well, he's not really revered by the left, I will show you that he is. Um, and then try to ask what was really unique about him? What's the nature of his, his legacy? 
So we're going to start with the biography, then we're going to try to look a little bit at some overarching themes about Begin and what I call off him and I speak about him, uh, his biblical statesmanship. And then we'll open it up for questions and we'll see where the questions take us. Paul will be uh, monitoring all the questions and he will uh, we'll, tell you more about that when, when we get there. So uh, I am going to share the screen with you and you should have the screen shared. Uh, okay, so we are going to be talking about uh, Menachem Begin, and once again, I want to express gratitude to the Begin Center for all their help uh, with the book, and to Paul for his ongoing years of friendship. It's been really a delight to get to know him and work with the various programs uh, that he did. Paul mentioned the book, so I just put it up here. Um, that's the book that will have a lot more information than what we are going to be able to cover this evening, um, but I think it's still out there. I think I actually saw it in the Begin Center store not that long ago. So it's out there. And we're going to be looking at his whole timeline at the beginning, uh, starting with his birth in 1913 in Brisk uh, and concluding with his passing away in 1992 in Tel Aviv. So we're going to start from the very beginning. Uh, so he's born in 1913, which, as you can understand, means that he's a very, very young boy during the course of the First World War. Uh, and he's really reaching, he's, you know, in, in his childhood and early adolescence in the period between the wars. He's a person who basically then grows up and comes of age between the two world wars. And I think it's also important to point out that even though we commonly say uh, that Begin was one of the founding fathers of the state of Israel, which there's no question that he was, uh, we tend to think of him as part of the same generation of uh, Ben-Gurion and others, but he's not. Uh, having been born in 1913, he's considerably younger. Uh, than Begin. Herzl, of course, has died nine years before Begin is even born. Uh, Jabotinsky dies in 1940, but is a generation older than Begin. So yes, he is definitely one of the founding fathers of the state of Israel, but he's kind of one of the second generation of leaders of Zionism. So he's born to Dov, uh, Zev Dov and Chasia Begin in Brisk. Uh, the Brisk family were the Soloveitchiks, were the main rabbinic family. Uh, more on that, which we might get to a little bit later. And during World War I, his family has to flee. He grew up in a relatively uh, impoverished home, not always destitute, but very often worried about where the next meal was coming from. Um, and with a father who was um, somewhat strict, but deeply in love with two things, the Tanakh and with the idea of Eretz Israel and the building of a Jewish state there. So he grows up in a very Zionist family. He grows up in a family in which the Tanakh was part and parcel of their life. He recorded, he called later in his life that when he was growing up, they would sit at the dinner table, especially on Shabbat. His father would say the first part of a pasuk, of a verse, uh, and they were expected to then continue the verse pleaded. Uh, so they move around a little bit during the First World War. They flee Brisk. They come back to Brisk in 1919. Uh, Brisk moves back and forth between Poland and Russia and Poland and Russia back and forth. But when they get back, it's part of Poland. He is at an early stage actually part of Ashomer Atzair, believe it or not, which is the you know socialist, almost communist, but definitely socialist youth organization that was very popular then. Uh, and his father, who took a very, very serious interest in his kids' education, yanked him out of, yanked him and his siblings actually, out of Hashomer Atzair and put them in Beitar, which was the youth movement of revisionist Zionism, which was the movement of Jabotinsky. Uh, his father had become convinced, this is actually very apropos to the world in which we live in today, that the universalism of socialism made people care more about socialists very far away than they did about Jews right at home. Uh, so he's yanked out of uh, Hashomer Atzair. He joins Beitar, which is the youth movement of revisionist Zionism, and he very, very quickly uh, begins to rise up the ranks. He's appointed the commander of the Beitar group in Brisk. Uh, and a little bit later that year, approximately, we don't know the exact date of that instance, but we believe that it was later in 1929, uh, he hears Zev Jabotinsky speak for the first time. Jabotinsky was, of course, a phenomenal orator. Begin will eventually become an even better orator. Uh, but Begin recalled that first encounter with Jabotinsky as saying that he wasn't just simply moved, but his life became dedicated to something. He was awed. He was kind of transported to a different place altogether. Um, and from the time that he hears Jabotinsky until they have a split later on, his life becomes one basically of trying to become part of the world that Jabotinsky is creating. 
Uh, he graduates from a local Polish high school in 1931. We won't go into all of the details, but there were all kinds of interesting things with his father and his father's children. Uh, Megan and his siblings, one brother and one sister, both of them were killed by the Nazis. Um, sorry, his brother was killed by the Nazis, his sister was not, I apologize. Uh, but he had two siblings and um, he, he enrolls in the Warsaw Law School a little bit later. But for example, when there was an exam on Shabbat in the local Polish high school, uh, his father told him that he should go take the exam on Shabbat. And what was the argument? The argument was uh, basically doing well in school is critical to making a livelihood. A livelihood makes you eat. So therefore, it's all directly related to pikuach nefesh, to saving your life. So therefore, it's pikuach nefesh to take the exam on Shabbat. Um, his father, unrelated to Shabbat and unrelated to school, used to tell the kids that they should brush their teeth on Yom Kippur morning because you don't go to God with your breath smelling. So his father was a kind of an interesting postache, very deeply committed to Jewish tradition, uh, knew a tremendous amount of the, about the Bible and Jewish history, but was not uh, rigorously, punctiliously observant. And that will be Begin's way throughout his life. He will, uh, at one point, we're not going to get into the details of this tonight, but at one point when he becomes prime minister to defuse a, a, an argument with Haredi members of Knesset, which is unfolding in his office, he can see that the conversation is just about to explode. And he says to them in Yiddish, Rabbi Sai, have you all daven mincha? And they haven't daven mincha, so they all stopped. They daven mincha, and by the time they were done, everybody had calmed down a little bit. So he's deeply Jewish, deeply traditional, observant of many things, but not punctiliously shomer mitzvot in the way that we speak about it today. Um, and, but he manages with all of that to go through law school, to complete law school uh, in 1935. He's rising up the, the ranks of uh, Beitar at this point, and he and Jabotinsky begin to have their differences. Jabotinsky, of course, had created what's called revisionist Zionism, Revisionist Zionism, revisionism, not in the sense of revisionist history, as in it didn't really happen this way, but revisionist Zionism really in opposition to Ben-Gurion Zionism. Ben-Gurion Zionism, Jabotinsky felt, was too accepting first of Turkish rule and then later on of British rule. Um, people needed to do more in order to make a Jewish state happen. Uh, and Begin took that even further. Um, and uh, over Jabotinsky's objections, he actually revises the Beitar Oath not only to include armed self-defense, but kind of preemptive conquest, which is an idea which will become interesting when we talk a little bit later on, probably mostly in the questions and answers about his attitudes towards the settlements, which of course is becoming an issue altogether um, because of the whole issue of Sikuach, of what's commonly called extending Israeli law into certain other parts of the, of the West Bank, whatever, all this nomenclature is very complicated. Um, he used the word settlements, by the way, without any question whatsoever. So we have every right to use that, that language, too. Um, he's appointed in 1939 the commissioner of Beitar, which meant that he was kind of the, the, the commander of Beitar in all of Poland. And part of what he had to do in that job was to raise money for Beitar. Um, so he was very frugal. We'll see something about his frugality a little bit later on. Uh, but he goes around Beitar, around Poland, raising money, and he certainly isn't staying in hotels or anything of the sort. Occasionally, he even sleeps outside, but usually he lands at the home of somebody who was supportive of the cause, and they would give him a warm meal, and they would let him sleep in a room, and then he would be on his way the next day after he had done what he had gotten to town to do. Uh, one time, he stayed at the Arnold's, and there was a young girl named Eliza sitting at the table, and shortly thereafter, he wrote her a letter. He wrote her, my lady, which was kind of adorable since she was, I think, 15 or 16. Uh, my lady, I only met you a few years ago, a few days ago, but I feel that I've known you all my life. And relatively in short order, they are married, uh, wearing their Beitar uniforms. Jabotinsky is at the wedding uh, and so forth. Of course, 1939, as we all know, is a very big year, not only in Menachem Begin's life because he becomes the commissioner of Beitar in Poland and because he marries Eliza, but of course, 1939 is also the beginning of the Second World War. In a move that Begin may later have come to regret, maybe not, it's not clear, different people who knew him very well disagree about this. Uh, without going into detail, some of his closest friends and some of his children um, don't agree about this particular interpretation. Uh, but there are those who definitely think that when later on in life, he actually regretted that he had left Poland and fled to the Soviet Union or to Russia, to the Soviet Union at that point. 
Um, there's a variety of reasons that they fled. Obviously, the Germans were invading Poland. Poland was a dangerous place to be. Um, and they wanted to get to Palestine, but they got stuck in Vilna and Lithuania. And they don't last long living on their own. He's arrested by the Soviet NKVD. And you can see actually his mugshot from when he was arrested um, at the right-hand side of the screen. Very interesting about the story of the NKVD, which we don't have enough time again to go in into in great detail tonight. We all know the story, right? We know that he was uh, arrested in, in 1940 and that by September 1941, he's already out. But we, we have to remember that the vast majority of people who were arrested by the NKVD, which is the original version of the KGB, were never heard from again. In other words, we take it as a matter of obvious fact that, of course, he was released and eventually became prime minister of Israel. But there was really no reason to imagine when he was arrested that he was going to survive or ever be released. Uh, and for that reason, Aliza uh, sends him a gift in prison. It's a bar of soap, uh, but he figures out very quickly that there has to be something in the soap, because why would she send him soap uh, in jail? By the way, if you've not read his book, White Nights, uh, which describes in large measure his being imprisoned uh, by the the Soviets, it's a book that's harrowing in its descriptions of Soviet prison life, but one of the two books that he wrote uh, and is really very worth, very worth reading. Uh, also, I saw it in the bookstore not that long ago uh, for the Begin Center, uh, but it's, it's widely available as well. In any event, she sent him this bar of soap and he does figure out that there's gotta be something inside it. Sure enough, there is, there's a little piece of paper or cloth um, and on the cloth are embroidered three letters, O-L-A. Uh, and he really couldn't figure out what it stood for. I mean, and I could, if we had more time, we could do this in a kind of a Socratic way. Uh, and I could ask you, what do you think it stands for? But somebody else who was in prison with him helped him realize that it didn't stand for anything. It was actually a word, and it meant hola. And that was Elisa's way of telling him, I'm going to Palestine. I'll wait for you in Palestine. I'm not going to be here. But if you ever do get out, don't go looking for me here. Go looking for me in Palestine. Uh, he's sentenced to eight years in Siberian labor camp for being a Zionist. Uh, he's asked to sign a document saying that he's guilty of being a Zionist. He says he refuses to sign a document saying he's guilty of being a Zionist because being a Zionist is not a crime. He's perfectly happy to sign a document saying he's a Zionist because that he's got nothing to be ashamed of uh, and he's perfectly proud of it. And that's very typical of Begin during the course of the rest of his life, his negotiations with Sadat, his negotiations with Carter, uh, he drove Carter crazy with his paying attention to every single detail. He was, don't forget, a lawyer, right? I mean, he was a lawyer, went to law school. He was had a brilliant, sharp mind. Um, and so when he said, I will sign a document saying that I'm a Zionist, but I won't say, I won't sign a document saying I'm guilty of being a Zionist, that was classic Begin. Sometime during that year, approximately, we don't know exactly, June, July, his father, Zev Dov, and his brother, Herzl, the mere fact that his brother's name was Herzl tells you something about his parents' attitudes to Zionism, uh, were killed by the Nazis. He apparently doesn't know that yet. He finds it out later. Um, he finds it out in a whole kind of circuitous way in the way many people here in the Yeshuv uh, were finding out that their relatives had been lost. But he is released from prison approximately in, in September of 1941 as part of the Anders Army of the Free Polish Forces. Now, the whole conversation, the whole issue of the Anders army and why it was formed and what its purpose was, was a complicated thing, but it was designed to fight, it was designed to fight the Germans, it was designed to support the Soviets, um, and the Soviets were therefore anxious to add people to the forces, and they took people who were imprisoned by the NKVD, if they were seemingly able-bodied or whatever, and they sometimes let them go so that they could join this army. Uh, this particular division of the army marches eastward, um, and he arrives in Palestine in 1942 at the age of 29. And just, I put it in purple because I want you to remember that he gets to Palestine at the age of 29. Um, so he actually enters Palestine, not through Haifa as, or Jaffa, for example, as Ben Gurion did. Uh, he comes in from the east side of the Jordan River. The army goes around. It goes like Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan down and comes in. He comes in from the east side. Uh, sort of the way B'nai Israel did uh, towards the end of uh, Deuteronomy and the beginning of the book of Joshua. Uh, again, unbeknownst to him at that time, likely in October, his mother, Hasia, is killed by the Nazis when they take over a hospital in which she had been hospitalized and kill all of the Jewish uh, patients. In 1943, a year later, 
uh, he is, takes control of the Irgun Tzva'i Le'umi, what's commonly called the Irgun, which was the underground military operation of revisionist Zionism. The previous commander had been killed in an operation outside of, of Israel, north of Israel, um, and Begin assumes control of the Irgun Tzva'i Le'umi. Uh, Benny Begin, of course, his son, who is still a well-known Israeli and involved periodically in Israeli politics, um, is, is born uh, in March 1st, March 1st. In 1944, shortly thereafter, and we're going to come back to this a little bit later on tonight, he declares the revolt on Great Britain. And this is the subject of his other great book called The Revolt, also still commonly available. And uh, he declares a revolt on Great Britain, and he has to go underground. He becomes the number one wanted person of the British in Palestine. They would very often post these posters. There's a picture of it in my book, but you can find it online in lots of different kinds of places. Uh, there, there's this poster, you know, the number one wanted person, number two wanted person, and there were very, very high rewards offered for Begin. And the picture that you see on this page is actually him as Rabbi Sassover. He adopted a number of personalities or disguises over the course of time, and that's him and Eliza and Benny. Uh, don't forget that at this point in Benny's life, uh, he has actually no idea that his parents aren't the Sassovers. He has no idea that his father is running the Irgun, uh, because you can't tell a little boy that age the truth, because boys and you know my granddaughter is exactly that age. Kids talk, they don't understand exactly what a secret is that you can't tell anybody. Uh, and Benny actually remembers, uh, and he talks about it periodically, what it was like to finally, when his father, Menachem Begin, could come out of hiding, hear that this terrible person that everybody was talking about, Menachem Begin, who blew up the King David Hotel, building, which we'll get to, of course, in just a few minutes, that was his father. Uh, but I also point out to this Rabbi Sassover disguise because he pulled it off. He gave shiurim. He gave the Torah. He wasn't a Talmud Chacham in the classic way that we think about it today, but he knew his way around Jewish texts. He knew Tanakh. He knew some rabbinic literature. Um, there's hardly a Begin speech in which psukim from the Tanakh do not appear, and there are many, many Begin lectures and articles in which rabbinic literature also does appear. Uh, after the Lechi, which is uh, a, a more radical military underground group, which was run then by Shamir, Yitzhak Shamir, uh, after they kill, assassinate Lord Moyne, the British launch what's called Saison, which is the beginning of a hunting season of going, trying to find the various members of the underground. All three organizations, the Haganah, which was Ben-Gurion's, the Irgun, which was Begin's, and the Lehi, which was Shamir's. And in the course of that 1945-ish, the Haganah, the Irgun, and the Lehi launch uh, Tnuat Hameri, the, the Hebrew resistance movement against the British. They will cooperate sometimes more. They will cooperate sometimes less. Uh, there will be times that they have agreed to cooperate, but then at the very last minute, that cooperation doesn't come to fruition. That's what happened to the King David. Uh, there are times when they try to cooperate, but the communication breaks down. Uh, that's what will happen in Dir Yassin a couple of years from now. Uh, but Bacon is still very much underground, though coordinating a little bit with the Irgun and the Lehi in terms of all kinds of different operations against the British. Uh, there's the Night of the Bridges, all sorts of things that they do to release Jewish prisoners, to destroy Jewish, to destroy British arms depots and all of that which we unfortunately don't have time to go into tonight, but the whole story of how the Irgun operated, that was very important. One thing that we should mention about the Irgun is that it was composed of Ashkenazim and Mizrahim. Mizrahim, for those who are not familiar, is the term that's commonly used for Jews of the Levant, meaning Jews of North Africa, Yemen, Iraq, Iran. And there were Jews coming from all those places. Some of them had already been there and some were making their way to Palestine at that point. Um, and the Irgun was known for having no issue whatsoever with what a Jewish person's skin color was. Um, the, one of the lines in the anthem of Beitar was, uh, In other words, a, a Hebrew, a Jew, doesn't matter how poor he is, is the son of a prince. And there was a kind of an egalitarianism about the Irgun, which was there, there was not about the Haganah, which was overwhelmingly Ashkenazi and some would say dismissive of Mizrahim, but that depends on who you ask. But it's just important to set the stage with what happened at the Irgun and how inclusive it was of Mizrahim for us to be able to understand why it is that Begin is eventually elected as prime minister in 1977, but we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. 
Achasia is born in May, and she is named, as you probably saw before, after his mother, who had been killed by the Nazis some years earlier. And Begin, of course, had found out about that by this point. Uh, and on July 22nd, uh, the King David Hotel building is bombed. And I make a point of saying that it's the King David Hotel building that's bombed and not the King David Hotel that was bombed, because bombing a hotel sounds like a pretty terrible thing. Um, but it wasn't a hotel. It had been built as a hotel and then it had functioned as a hotel. But the vast majority of the building was actually being used as a kind of essential headquarters for the British officers. It was also an area where the British were storing a tremendous amount of documents. The British had on an operation called Shabbat HaShorah, which we, they called it Operation Agatha, uh, but the, the, the Irgun and the Yeshuv, which is the term used for pre-state Jewish government in Israel or Palestine, then Israel, uh, they called it Shabbat HaShorah, the Black Sabbath, where the British had collected a tremendous amount of evidence, mostly papers, documents, memoranda, telegrams, and so on and so forth, uh, that they were gonna use to actually try to try and then imprison and possibly even execute people who were at the head of the Jewish organizations at that time. Could have been David Ben-Gurion, it might have been Golda Meir, it certainly could have been Menachem Begin. Uh, and the group, the various groups, especially the Haganah and the Irgun, agreed to work together to destroy the King David Hotel building in order to destroy the evidence that was in the building. The idea was never to kill people, uh, but the idea was to give enough time for the people to get out, but not enough advanced warning for them to get the evidence out. And as I'm sure everybody now knows, um, that plan went terribly awry. First of all, the Haganah dropped out and the Irgun was left uh, to do the work itself. They planted, they planted, um, dynamite in milk canisters. As you face the front of the King David these days, looking at the front door from King David Street, so it's on the right-hand side of the hotel in the basement where they were planted. Now it's where the beauty salon is and all of that. Uh, but back then, they, that's where they put it. And um, they did call in. They called into the Palestine Post. They called into the French Embassy. They called into the hotel itself, and they or the building itself, and they said, uh, there are bombs about to go off in number of minutes, get everybody out of the hotel. And the British chose to ignore the, the warning. There was a, a rumor going around that one British officer in the King David said, we are here to give the Jews orders, not to take orders from the Jews. Uh, that's a very commonly said thing about the incident. It is apparently not true. There's no evidence anywhere that this officer actually said that. Uh, but everything else is completely true. The, bill, the bombs did go off. A large number of people were killed, British soldiers, actually, some Jews, uh, foreigners, and so on and so forth. And that is where, really, Begin gets the appellation of being a terrorist, which he will really never shake, at least until he signs the peace treaty with Sadat, um, a process that begins in 77 and ends in 79. Uh, but certainly, when he's elected in 77, American Jews are apoplectic. Uh, oh my God, Israelis elected this terrorist. He blew up the King David Hotel. And they imagined the hotel that they had gone to or could go to, but it was nothing of the sort. You can actually, by the way, find photographs of the King David Hotel back then. Uh, and it's like the green zone in Baghdad, the American green zone. You know, we now assume you get in your car, you drive down King David Street, and you, know, you pass the King Solomon Hotel on the left. And then you pass, uh, you know, the car rental agencies on the left, you pass the King David on the right, then you get to uh, the, the, the Citadel Hotel, then you get to the Mamilla Hotel, you know, you just go drive. But it wasn't anything like that. That road was there, but it was completely closed off. The King David was surrounded by rings and rings of barbed wire and, and guard stations and so forth. It was thought to be impregnable, uh, but it wasn't obviously impregnable. And they were able to, um, they were able to, infiltrate it and get the bombs in. Why is that important? It's important because any British mother or father who had a kid serving in the British army in Palestine now understood that there was nothing that the British could do to keep their kids safe. I mean, it's very similar to what happened with America in the Vietnam War. Once the three major stations, NBC, CBS, and ABC began to show which they had not done, but began to show video footage of the coffins coming back to Dover Air Force Base. Um, then Americans began to see coffins after coffins after coffins, and the Yarad Lehem Simon, as we say in Hebrew, they kind of got it all of a sudden, 
we're not winning this war. And when the King David was destroyed or very badly damaged uh, by the Irgun, British parents back in London and back in wherever they were um, said to themselves, the, the government can't keep our kids safe and the support for staying in Palestine begins to crumble. Don't forget support for staying in India is crumbling for very similar kinds of reasons. The empire is falling apart. Uh, the British are, are really out of money at the end of the Second World War. They are much more concerned, local citizens are, about rebuilding England itself and worrying much less about the British Empire. Um, and because of that, eventually, the, uh, the British will announce shortly thereafter that they are leaving Palestine and they turn over um, the question of what should happen to Palestine to the United Nations. It's called UNSCOP, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine which of course eventually on November 29th, 1947, Kaftet November, there's a street here in Jerusalem named for it, uh, will create a plan to create two states, one Jewish state and one Arab state, which of course, as we all know the history here, uh, the Jews accepted and the Arabs rejected. Uh, 1948, um, we, uh, Leah is born, but we'll just go through some of the major things. There is the Dir Yassin event, which we won't go to in much detail now. That's another one of those operations that went awry. It was supposed to be done uh, in concert with others, including the Lehi. Uh, the trucks got stuck in the mud. Men were sent in who were really not well trained. Uh, they panicked. Uh, the communications equipment didn't work. And a lot of Arabs in the town were killed. And it was commonly called a kind of a butchering or whatever you want to call it, you know, massacre. Etc. Now, interestingly enough, everybody had a vested interest in exaggerating the numbers of people who were killed. The Arabs, of course, had a vested interest in exaggerating the number of people because they wanted to get world support. Uh, the Jews had a vested interest in exaggerating the number of people because they wanted the Arabs to be scared. Right? It's very clear at this point that you know uh, the the war, which is in its first half now, which is an informal war, is going to turn into a formal war once Israel declares independence. And so the more Arabs are fleeing from that point of view, uh, the better. The book that you see on the right, which unfortunately has not been translated into English, uh, Eliezer Tauber, who wrote Dir Yassin Sof Hamitos, Dir Yassin, The End of the Mythology, actually traced each and every single person who was killed in the village uh, and was able to show what happened to them and was able to demonstrate, he claims, I find it fairly convincing, but I'm not the world's greatest expert on Dir Yassin, uh, that almost no innocent bystanders were killed, that virtually everybody who was killed was involved in some way in the fighting. Uh, but again, this is one of those things that really sullies Begin, Sully Begin's uh, reputation for a very long time, even though the death was never part of the plan. Part of the plan was to go in there and scare them and have them leave because Dir Yassin was being used as a place from which to basically block the road to Jerusalem. As you drive into Jerusalem and you see Haram and Uchot, the gigantic cemetery on the right-hand side of the top of the hill, that's more or less where Dir Yassin was, right around there. Um, and so you understand that if you control that hill, just like today your car goes by, anybody on that hill could hit your car. Uh, that was the same thing there. So Dir Yassin was <clears throat> a critically important spot for opening the road to Jerusalem, which of course Yitzhak Rabin did uh, in his 20s. Um, but the, the plan went wrong, and I only mention it at somewhat greater length because it, it's, it's very critical to what happens to Begin's reputation. David Ben-Gurion on May 14th, of course, declares Israeli independence. Uh, Begin is not there, but he and Ben-Gurion, to say that they didn't like each other would be to put it very, very mildly. Uh, he's not invited. Um, and uh, as it happens, by the way, he actually was really still technically in hiding because the British, the British don't actually end the mandate until the next day. So when he come out of hiding, he theoretically could have still been arrested by the British, though whether they would have bothered or not um, remains, you know, we'll never know. Uh, on June 15th, about a month after the state of Israel is founded, he creates the Khairut party and uh, he will enter the political opposition where he will remain for 29 years. And here, this is again in um, purple. He comes to Israel at the age of 29. And then, so his first 29 years are outside of Eretz Israel. The next 29 years after Israel is created, not between the time that he gets to Israel and now, but from 48 on for 29 years, he will remain uh, in a different kind of exile. He'll be in the political exile. and He'll be the head of the opposition. Obviously, 1948 plus 29 is 1977, and um, we'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, the sinking of the Altalena is a complicated story. I'm sure most of you have heard of it, but in any event, 
he um he uh does not know that other members of the of Beitar, basically the Irgun and Beitar revisionist Zionism, including uh, Eri Jabotinsky, Jabotinsky's son, and a few others in America have bought this boat and then have bought arms and have had it sail from France to Palestine. Begin knows nothing of this. And by this time, there's already a state. And Ben-Gurion has insisted that all of the various free state underground military operations be melded into one organization called the IDF. Uh, when Begin gets 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 you know information that this boat is is heading there. He, he doesn't really believe Be uh, Begin that Begin didn't know about it. But Begin insists that some of the arms be given to his men who are guarding Jerusalem, which was not technically inside the state of Israel. So his point was, in Israel, I accept completely that there's this idea of one army, Sahal, the Israel and the Israel Defense Forces. But outside of Israel, there's no reason that that rule has to apply. My men, he says, in the Irgun are still trying to fight, hold on to Jerusalem which Ben-Gurion has basically given up on, I need some arms for my men. Give me at least a portion of them for my men. Ben-Gurion will hear nothing of it. There's a lot of negotiations. The boat sails from the north shore to the southern shore, right outside Tel Aviv. Uh, and then the order is given by Ben-Gurion, actually by Rabin. It's like Rabin gives the order uh, to fire at the Altalena. There's actually a very moving story about a young South African man who actually um, you know, fires the cannon. I write about it in the book. Uh, we don't have time to go into it tonight. But the Altalena, of course, is loaded with arms and it explodes. Begin is on the boat. He's gone to the boat both to negotiate and to meet his men. He's, you know, he's superhuman as far as they're concerned. He's a huge hero. Uh, and as the boat is beginning to catch fire, uh, he really doesn't want to leave the boat. He's actually insistent that he not leave the boat. Uh, and there are people who argue that the reason he refused to leave the Altalena was that he was still haunted by the rumors about his having left Poland too early and left the members of Beitar behind when he fled to Russia. Uh, and because of that accusation, some say, again, I want to repeat that not everybody buys this. Um, some say that he was, that was so much with him that um, he, um, he refused to leave the Altalena. But eventually he's taken off the boat right before it really explodes. Uh, he makes his way to the, to the shore. It wasn't that far offshore. Even though he couldn't swim, he manages to get there. Uh, and then the, actually a civil war really does break out. Not everybody knows this, but there was fighting between uh, the Irgun forces who were part of Tzahal and the Haganah forces that were part of Tzahal. They go back to their previously existing groups. There's some shooting in Tel Aviv. People on both sides are killed. Uh, and Begin is the one who intercedes by going to the radio and saying, absolutely not. With the enemy at the gate, there can be no civil war. Uh, and asked at the end of his life what he thought his greatest contribution to the state of Israel was. He said it was preventing civil war uh, in 1948. And I think it's very important for all of us who care deeply about Israel, who will see occasionally the vitriol in Israel getting to be to dangerously high levels, uh, to remember what Begin said, that his greatest contribution was lowering the rhetoric and stopping the fighting to make sure that we did not have a civil war on our hands at that point. Uh, Israel holds its first elections on 1949, in January 49. Herut, his party, wins 14 seats. Then comes the big battle about reparations from Germany. And this is important to mention for two reasons. First of all, reparations is a um, very complicated thing. The German word for reparation is Wiedergutmachung. And as you probably know, you can take a German word and break it up into its constituent components. Wieder is again. Gut is obviously good, like good Shabbos, good Yantif. Machung is to, to make, like Mach Shabbos, um, to make. So to make things good again. And Begin, who has actually gone into a sort of political retirement very early on and is writing a book, um, gets called back to re-enter the political fray here because the people from Cheirut understand that there's nobody who's going to be more able to argue against making a deal with Germany. Uh, and Begin really begins to be a central personality in Israeli politics in 1952. Uh, you can see the picture of him uh, campaigning against reparations on the right-hand side. Uh, Ben-Gurion made a lot of out of this picture because of the mustache, and he all too often said some not very nice things at all about uh, mustaches and Hitler and all of that, completely illegitimate to have said. Uh, but they both took great excesses. Uh, Begin actually said during one of the uh, protests that took place in Kikar Zion, at the bottom of Ben Yehuda, don't, don't forget that the Knesset was at the top of the street there. If you take Ben Yehuda up to King George Street now and make a left and go, I don't know, 150 yards, 
down the road on the right hand side is a building that's now being refurbished as a, a, a museum of the Knesset, but that's where the Knesset was. And Begin has one of his uh, very, very important protests against reparations in Kikar Zion and Zion Square down there. And in this speech, he says, when it came to the Altalena, I said, no, there will be no fighting between brothers. And this time I will say yes, uh, which was probably a line that he very much regretted for the rest of his life. Uh, because people said that basically Begin had threatened to use force against the democratically elected Knesset. Uh, there was really no other way to read that speech. That speech is widely available, and if you read it, uh, there's just no other way to understand that speech. I'm sure there were parts of him that regretted it, but nonetheless, there was actually a little bit of uh, violence at the Knesset. People threw rocks into the Knesset, and the tear gas that the police had fired outside the Knesset uh, wafted into the Knesset, so the tear gas is inside the Knesset also. Begin has said some very nasty things about Ben-Gurion. Uh, he's banned from the Knesset for three months. Um, but anyway, it's really the, it's really the, mo the moment at which he becomes, and the reason that I called the book that I wrote, The Battle for Israel's Soul, Menachem Begin, The Battle for Israel's Soul, is because he really then became the, the, the protector of Israel's Jewish soul, as he saw it. Uh, Richard Soblin was a, a, an American spy uh, for Russia. The Americans were going to imprison him. He had leukemia. They let him out of prison for a day or two to get his affairs in order before serving a light sentence. He escapes to Israel. Uh, Ben-Gurion clearly did not want to have a fight with the Americans at that point. So he just had Soblin turn, o turn over to the States uh, before Soblin could have any kind of legal process in Israel about whether or not he should be extradited. Uh, and Begin, the lawyer here, actually came to Soblin's defense. Uh, he wasn't in favor of people spying uh, uh, you know, against America for the Soviet Union. That he thought was reprehensible. Uh, but he did feel that Israel should not be afraid of America, which is a very interesting thing given what's going on right this week. And he said, of whom are we afraid? What, we're afraid of the Americans? Don't forget, Israel in 1962 was a two by nothing country with, not, with an, a still unproven army. Uh, but nonetheless, it's really characteristic of Begin you don't be afraid of anybody. The next major thing that will happen in Begin's career, he'll be in the opposition, and he's going to be, he's obviously extremely literate. He's extremely productive literarily. He writes all the time. He is known far and wide as the best public orator in the state of Israel without question. Um, he will eventually make one step further into the center of Israeli politics in 1967 when Israel gets into the, into the Six-Day War. Most people in our conversation tonight, which will become more of a conversation very shortly, probably know that Lady Eshkel was at that point prime minister. Uh, David Ben-Gurion has gone into retirement. Uh, and Eshkel was not projecting any confidence for Israelis. He had a stuttering speech, which wasn't really his fault because it was typed at the last minute and he had to mark it up and he couldn't read what he's written. Uh, but Israelis were desperately worried about Eshkol being prime minister during the 67 war. There's a national unity government, so Begin is now part of the government. And the first thing that he argues or suggests is that Ben-Gurion should be approached and asked to come back as prime minister, which is an extraordinary thing given how much Ben-Gurion hated Begin and Begin hated Ben-Gurion. And Begin believed, perhaps correctly, that in the Al Tolena affair in 1948, Ben-Gurion had actually tried to have Begin killed. Um, there's no way to know for sure, but there is some indication of that. Um, so the idea that Begin would actually say, let's bring Ben-Gurion back was unbelievable. And although Ben-Gurion turned down the request, said, no, I'm done, I don't wanna be prime minister anymore, he did hear that it was Begin's idea that he returned. And that was the beginning of their approachment which really continued until 1973 in December uh, when Ben-Gurion dies. Uh, he's already, Ben-Gurion is, is very much out of it in the last few months of his life. But until Ben-Gurion no longer comes to Jerusalem, uh, Begin and he actually had a kind of rapprochement. There's some very touching stories about them meeting up in the cafeteria of the Knesset and Ben-Gurion going out and getting chairs for Begin. I mean, things that you would not have expected before 67 all of a sudden happened in 60, in 67. He resigns from the national unity government in 70 and 73, he forms the Likud party. And in 1977, labor is completely washed out. There are a variety of reasons for that. First of all, labor has lost the uh, 73 war, the October war, the Yom Kippur war, which was a disaster for Israel in many ways. It's true that Israel at the end of the day managed to recapture all the land, uh, but don't forget that in 1967, 
Uh, Israel tripled its size, losing approximately 600 soldiers. In 1973, Israel barely clawed its way back to the starting lines, so to speak, which was an enormous military accomplishment given how badly it had started, uh, but it lost 2,600, 2,700 soldiers. Uh, it was a disaster. And Golda Meir, who was the prime minister then, uh, was, as you probably know, pushed out of office. Uh, because of the commission that investigated her and all of the, the mistakes that were made in the conduct of the war. Yitzhak Rabin comes in and is prime minister. Then he has to resign because his wife is found having had some money, and really a small amount of money in an American account, but it was technically uh, illegal. And therefore, Israelis who don't have enough money and the economy is not in great shape, see gold the the American Ashkenazi, uh, you know, privileged, as they would say today, uh, not having done a good job, Rabin apparently being somewhat dishonest. I mean, by today's terms, there's nothing dishonest about that at all. But back then, that was considered to be dishonest. Many Israelis have had it with uh, the Labor Party. The Labor Party just seems to them to feel like a party that's ruled Israel from the very, very beginning now for 29 years without any interruption, and it's time for a change. And the people that feel that especially are the Mizrahi Jews. And it's on the strength of Mizrahi vote that Begin is elected uh, in, in 1977, in May. In June, he's not even prime minister yet. He's been elected, but he hasn't been sworn in yet. And there's the very famous story of these Vietnamese refugees who were in the South China Sea, uh, and they had been ignored. They were dying. They were on little boats. Uh, men were getting no food and no water. Women and children were getting no food, but they were getting one teaspoon of water a day. You heard that correctly. One teaspoon of water a day to barely keep themselves alive. Uh, an Israeli ship uh, sails by, sees what's happening, radios back to Israel. Begin says, take them on board, even though every other ship that had passed them had refused, um, and uh, says, we'll make them citizens. He doesn't just give them residency in Israel, he gives them citizens. And this picture of Begin uh, meeting these refugees is really classic Begin. Begin was, if there was anybody devoted to the Jewish people in the history of the Jewish people, it was Menachem Begin. But Begin's deep devotion to the Jewish people never came at the expense of his devotion to humanity in general. And um, this picture, I think, really captures his humanness in a, in a very special way, in addition to one other picture that I'll show you uh, at the very end. In November, um, Anwar Sadat goes to the Egyptian parliament in a very famous speech that I'm sure most people here know about, says, and I hereby declare to Prime Minister Begin that I am willing to go to Jerusalem and to negotiate a peace. Uh, so that had unleashed the 1973 Yom Kippur War not to destroy Israel. That's a common misconception. Uh, the, uh, the 67 war which was launched by Nasser had been launched in order to destroy Israel. But that was not why uh, Sadat launched the 73 war. Sadat launched the 73 war to soften Israel up, to make it clear to Israel you can't keep defeating us forever. We just want the Sinai back. We want, it was an Egyptian pride. And, and at the end of the day, by the way, it worked. I mean, at the end of the day, Sadat accomplished exactly what he wanted to accomplish uh, with the October 73 war. Uh, Begin, of course, immediately invites him to come to Israel. And as many people remember, that on the follow, a couple of weeks later, on a Motzei Shabbat, Sadat, uh, Sadat lands in Israel. There were many people in Israel who thought it was a trick. Uh, if you remember the old terminal at Ben Gurion before the new terminal, which was called Natbag Al Paim, Natbag 2000, which opened up, I think, in 2004, whatever it was. But if you recall the old, uh, old uh, Begin, uh, sorry, Ben Gurion Airport with that one little flat terminal that was built, there were actually Israeli snipers all along the roof of that building with their rifles pointed at the opening of the Egyptian aircraft. Uh, because they were not entirely convinced that the door was going to open and it wouldn't be Anwar Sadat, but be a bunch of Egyptian commandos. Of course, it wasn't that. And it led to the entire couple of years of negotiations between Sadat and Begin and Carter, uh, which we're not going to go into detail now, which is going to take too much time. But eventually, Carter and Begin are both awarded uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, even before, by the way, even before the deal is actually signed. Interestingly enough, Begin goes and gives a very, very famous speech at the Nobel Awards, um, Sadat does not go. He's actually worried that he'll be assassinated there. So he sends his son-in-law, about which one could make, of course, a lot of son-in-law jokes. Uh, but he says, you know, basically, honey, you know, I, I don't want to go. Would you please go for me? His son-in-law does go. 
thank God nothing happened to him. But of course, sending his son uh, to Stockholm didn't do any good in the end of the day because obviously Sadat is killed by his own armed forces a little bit later anyway, and the, the peace treaty is signed in 1979. Uh, in, June 80, in June 1981, Israel destroys the Osirak uh, nuclear reactor. My wife and I were actually on our honeymoon when that happened, and we came back to the hotel one day, and we look in those little newspaper boxes, and it said, Israel destroys Iraqi nuclear reactor. And we burst out laughing, like, that's so ridiculous. It's one of those National Enquirer stories, you know, Mon monkey marries Martian. Uh, but at the end of the day, it turns out that it wasn't so crazy, and uh, it was true. And that begins what Israel has until today, which is called uh, the, the Begin Doctrine, which is that no sworn enemy of the state of Israel will ever be allowed to get a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, Eud Olmert invoked the Begin Doctrine when he destroyed the reactor outside Damascus. Uh, and Bibi continually uh, evokes the, the Begin Doctrine when he says that he will never allow Iran uh, to get a nuclear weapon. Now, how that will play out, you know, is anybody's guess. Um, but so Begin goes, ironically, from getting a peace prize uh, to then achieving even greater status by launching a military operation uh, in Iraq, and then, of course, launches a huge military operation, which is the beginning of the Lebanon War. It starts out being called Operation Peace for the Galilee. The Sabra and Shatila massacre, which you know Israeli soldiers played no role, but definitely allowed the Muslims to go in and to massacre the Christians. Um, that whole thing happens in September. And then in November, Eliza is hospitalized. She had long, had long had asthma, very bad asthma and other respiratory difficulties. And she's hospitalized in Ain Karam, in Adassa Hospital in Ain Karam. And Begin is supposed to go to speak to the annual meeting of federations in Los Angeles. Um, and he goes to the hospital to see her. And she says, you should definitely go. I'll be fine. Uh, he gets on the plane. He flies to Los Angeles on Shabbat. Um, she dies. And they, um, may, they call his hotel. Century Hotel in, in uh, Los Angeles. He's out, he's at shul, and then he's hanging around with people and he doesn't get back to the afternoon until very late. Uh, he's told what happened. They immediately pack up, they go back right back to Los Angeles National Airport. He gets on his plane, uh, flies home, and those people who were on the plane with him, it's actually chilling, but those people who were on the plane with him said he was in his room all by himself. Um, sort of mumbling or crying, Lama Azav Tiyota, Lama Azav Tiyota. Why did I leave her? Why did I leave her? So he is now a broken man because Aliza and he had been together really forever. Uh, it was a love story from beginning to end. And then shortly thereafter, the Kahan Commission issues its reports on Sabra and Shatila. He's had to actually give testimony in front of the Kahan report of uh, the commission and its fines that Sharon had lied, and he understands that Sharon had probably lied to him. Uh, Israeli soldiers, in the meantime, are dying in Lebanon in not small numbers, and protesters are standing outside his room in his house, right near where the protests were held for Gilad Sheet, right outside where those protests are, always, are still held to this very day, uh, holding up the number of people who'd been killed. And his advisors say to him, you know what, we'll just move them down the road a little bit, because they could see how distressed Begin was uh, by these numbers of kids who were dying. And Begin said, no, it's a democracy. They have a right to show me the numbers. Uh, but at the end of the day, the numbers did their job. And the combination of the humiliation of the Kahan Commission, even though they didn't say that he had personally done anything wrong, um, the humiliation of the Kahan Commission, Aliza's death, his guilty at not having been there, his health is beginning to crack. Um, the, the war is not going well. The man who had gotten the Nobel Peace Prize is now stuck in a war that he had started. Uh, he can't take it anymore, and he resigns on September 15th, and he goes into seclusion. He will live almost 10 years, um, at, during which time he will come out occasionally for memorial services on Aliza's yard site, but not even that every year, and for doctor's appointments. And that is it. The Israeli public never sees him again. Uh, and it's very ironic and, to me, heartbreaking that the man who really began his career in creating the Jewish state by going underground and hiding from the British uh, ends his career and ends his life uh, going underground and hiding from the Israelis. Uh, a very, very sad, tragic conclusion to the last decade of his life. Uh, in 92, he suffers a heart attack and six days later, uh, he dies at the age of 79 and is buried on the Mount of Olives. That 
in a certain way is the not only of Menachem Begin, but it's in a certain way also the story of the state of Israel. And the question could become, you know, I mean, how how do Israelis this many years back look on look on Menachem Begin, who had this reputation of being a right winger? We didn't even talk about the settlements and his support for the settlement movement. We didn't talk about his having dramatically increased the number of Haredi exemptions from the army. It's true that Ben Gurion had given the initial ones, but Begin expanded the number very far. So between Sabra and Shatila and the King David Hotel, he certainly was not seen as a man of peace by many people. No prize undid some of that. He was seen as a right winger by many people because he said he would never create a Palestinian state because he would never, uh, you know, he he. Um, he was not willing to, uh, you know, say to the Haredim that they had to go to the army. He was in favor of the settlement and so forth. So how was he viewed? Uh, not that long ago, uh, Haaretz, this is actually a screenshot from Haaretz, they ranked what was then Israel's 12 prime ministers. Now, Haaretz, and we all probably understand that Haaretz is a very uh, solidly left-leaning newspaper, to put it very mildly. There's obviously, number one is not in, not in contention, right? Everybody knows who Haaretz is going to think was the best prime minister Israel ever had. It's, you know, the George Washington of Israel, it's Menachem Begin. The question was really, where was going to, where was, um, oh, sorry, David Ben-Gurion. Where's Menachem Begin, though, going to rank in the next group? Uh, and here's what Haaretz came up with. The first place was, of course, David Ben-Gurion. But Menachem Begin was rated by Haaretz the second best prime minister that Israel ever had. Now, you can say, by the way, that he was the best prime minister. I mean, you know, just because they give him a score of 8.04 doesn't mean anything. I just wanted you to see this as an example of how the left has come to have an enormous amount of admiration uh, for who it is that Menachem Begin was and what he stood for. And the question really then is, what was it that they saw in him? And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about these things, really just a few minutes, and then we'll open it up. I think they saw him as a biblical statesman, and there were principles that animated him at all times. The Bible as a kind of a Jewish historical epic, which I'll come back to, the moral clarity of the Tanakh, the centrality of Jewish peoplehood in the Tanakh. Don't forget, Paro starts out by saying, Hine am b'nei Yisrael. Here are the people, the children of Israel. This balance of universalism and particularism, I mean, the Tanakh starts out, with universalism, the whole creation of humankind. And then in Genesis chapter 12 goes to particularism, you know, God saying to Abram, I'm gonna make you into a great and mighty nation. The pathos and passion of Menachem Begin. And of course, being buried on Mount of Olives is a distinctly biblical image as opposed to Har Herzl, which obviously does not appear uh, anywhere in the Tanakh. So I wanna say just a little bit more about each of these things really quick, and then we'll, then we'll open it up. Look, the Bible as uh, the Bible, as a major narrative. He saw the Bible as a grand story of Jewish history, and he saw the creation of the state of Israel as the next part of that history. This was the continuation of the Tanakh, which is, by the way, why he saw Israeli generals as great heroes. As far as he was concerned, Ariel Sharon was the next Yoav ben Suriah. If Yoav ben Suriah was King David's general, then Ariel Sharon was his general. Uh, and it was therefore unthinkable to him that Sharon would have lied to him, even though most people agree that Sharon did, though not everybody does. Um, biblical language, he called Brisk, the city of his birth, Ir Ba'em Be Yisrael, uh, a city and a mother of Israel, which is something that, that gets said in the second book of Samuel in the very story of uh, Sheva ben Michi. Um, but he also had a sense that, um, you know what, what, what Haman says to Achashverosh, Yesh no Amechad, which was Amfarad Ben Ha'amim. There is one people that is different from all the other peoples in the world, uh, and it is not in the king's interest to let them survive. And Menachem Begin believed that that was just never going to change. That anybody who thought for a moment that that was going to change just did not understand the way the world worked. If you knew Tanakh and you knew the history of the 20th century, then you had to be the most naive person on the planet if you believed that the Jews were ever going to be accepted. Uh, little did he know where Europe would go once again, you know, in our own time. Um, and he was therefore kind of a very, a, a biblical statesman in the sense that he saw the unfolding of the state of Israel as another chapter in the story of the Bible. Um, but when we read Tanakh, all of us read the Bible. Um, however we read it, whenever we read it, we understand that there's a tremendous clarity to the Bible as well, right? There are clear moral principles in the Bible that are not 
negotiable. Uh, and they came out through and through in Begin's life. You'll remember the ships like the Exodus and the St. Louis and the Struma and the Patria. These were all ships that, that had tried to get people into Palestine, some of them successfully, some of them not successfully. And whenever the British could arrest these people, uh, they did. They sent some of them back to Cyprus. They sent, put some of them in a police. The Jews in the St. Louis never made it to Palestine. They were trying to go to Cuba, but they ended up going back to Germany. Begin saw the British sealing of the shores of Palestine when the Jews were living in a burning Europe as an attack on the Jewish people. And he said what the Tanakh teaches is that when there's no one else to save the Jewish people, somebody has to save the Jewish people. And so he declares the revolt against the British, becomes the number one wanted man. But it wasn't because he wanted the glory. It just felt like in biblical sense, somebody had to stand up for him. He came out against reparations. It wasn't because he just wanted to keep the fight with the Germans going. But it was, how do you make it good again? They had killed his mother. They had killed his father. They had killed his brother. And he said to Ben-Gurion, how much are you getting from my mother? Marks, are you getting from my brother? And he said, There's just no, there's no number. Now, by the way, at the end of the day, and Benny Begin said this to me once in a private conversation that I thought was very moving. He said to me, You know, in your book, you actually give Ben Goyan a very hard time and you come out on the side of my father. I said, Yeah, that's true. He said, Well, that's all good, but don't forget, my father was the head of the opposition. He didn't have to feed the people. He didn't have to give them roofs over their heads. That was Ben-Gurion's job. And at the end of the day, of course, the money that Israel got from Germany not only gave food and shelter to those Jews who had immigrated, but was the first time that Israel could buy cranes and bulldozers. And that's really the beginning of the building of Israel's infrastructure. So it's not that there's a right side and a wrong side, but his passion against the, the uh, reparations was clear, as was, by the way, God gave the Jews a certain amount of land. Um, and it included Judea and Samaria as far as he was concerned. And he was never, ever, ever going to give it up. Now, interestingly enough, as many of you know, he had a right-hand man named Yechiel Kadashai, who was with him throughout his whole career. By the time I wrote my book, sadly, Menachem Begin himself had long since been deceased. Uh, but thank God, Yechiel Kadashai was still very much alive. He has since, unfortunately, passed away as well. But I went and visited him on a number of occasions in his lovely apartment in Tel Aviv. Uh, and he would recite some poem for me from Jabotinsky and say, no, how does it finish? Just like Begin's father did to Begin with Tanakh on Friday night. And I'd say, I don't know. So he would run to the, to, to the bookcase, grab a book of, Jabot of, of poetry, open it up, say, read this, and make me read the poetry out loud. It was great. I mean, I loved it. It was really brought back into an old era of Zionist thought. But this was during the beginning of the Obama administration. And as you know, as you know, Obama and Israel were often at odds, especially about settlements and so forth. And it was one time when I was at Kadishai's house and something was going on between Obama and, uh, and Bibi, I guess it was Bibi then. Uh, I said to Kadishai, if Begin was prime minister, what would he do? And I expected him to say, oh, he would never give in, he would whatever. And he was quiet. And then he said, and the Musag. Tell you the truth, I have absolutely no idea. Meaning that was also part of Begin's greatness. Part of Begin's greatness was he understood that history was unpredictable. You would not have predicted that Menachem Begin would have been the person to have given back the Sinai in exchange for peace. A lot of people thought that peace wouldn't hold. He thought it would. He so far turned out to be right. You would not have predicted, as he was winging his way back home from getting the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, that he would be the person that would get Israel into its longest war, a war that is still obviously very controversial. Uh, but Yekadishai understood that though Begin was a man of unbelievable principle, he was also a realist, and that made him a little bit unpredictable. Um, I want to just end up here and say that you know the universalism and the particularism, it's not only the Vietnamese uh, refugees that he took in, but it was Menachem Begin, of all people, who pushed to end Israel's military rule over Israeli Arabs. You're probably aware that Israel, beginning in 1948, put Israeli Arab citizens under a different rule than Jewish citizens. It's not talking about Palestinians and the other side of the Green Line. We're talking about Arabs who are inside Israel, in Jaffa, in wherever. They were under military rule. They had to get approval to move from one town to another. And in 1948 and 1949 and 1950, you could probably, perhaps, make an argument for that because of a complicated situation then. But at a certain point, don't forget, Menachem Begin, the lawyer, says, you can't do that. 
you, you can't you can't have two categories of citizens that's not the kind of democracy that we want to be uh, and military rule over Israeli Arabs ends in the mid-1960s. And when it does, even Israeli Arabs understand, by the way, that it was Menachem Begin who had been a, a, a very chief, a chief um, architect of that. I want to just go back and show you one last thing on the screen, and then we'll open it up. Um, this picture on the right is one of my favorite pictures of, of Begin. They're on a plane. Some of you may recall that it was a whole brouhaha with Bibi not that long ago. I don't know, four years ago, five years ago, six years ago, when he was flying to England and um, spent, I think, $40,000 or something to have a bed put in the plane for the four or five hour flight to England. Uh, this was a, on a flight uh, to the States. So you can see they're just in, I mean, they're in first class, obviously, which the prime minister deserves to be, um, but there were no beds, there was no special anything. Her purse is on the floor right there. And there's Menachem Begin helping her tie her shoe. And uh, for me, that has always just captured kind of the decency, the humility, the caring nature of the relationship. Uh, he was really a prime minister unlike any Israel ever had before, uh, and a prime minister unlike Israel has ever had since. I wanted to call my book uh, Menachem Begin, Israel's Jewish Prime Minister. The publisher thought that was too edgy and too controversial, so I couldn't do it. But I really, if I could do it all over again, maybe I would actually put up more of a fight. Uh, the battle for Israel's soul was kind of my second best choice, but he really was Israel's Jewish prime minister. He was the prime minister who more than anyone else really knew Jewish sources, loved Jewish sources, saw the state of Israel as a continuing chapter of the Bible, uh, and who I think really did succeed at many, many, many things, among them instilling a deep Jewish consciousness into the state uh, that he helped create. Yehi zichro baruch, may his memory be a blessing. So I will stop up with that and we'll let Paul open it up and uh, shepherd us through. Thank you very, very much. That was wonderful. Thank you very much, Daniel Gordis. Um, okay, there's a, there's a bunch of questions, um, including a couple which are kind of similar uh, <laughs> to the one you asked in Chil Kadeshai. Um, so I don't know if you'll, if you'll, if you'll answer more um, uh, with more detail than he did or try and, try and get into into Begin's head more than he did, that's up to you. But I'll just put them to you and you can take them as you wish. So uh, there were a couple of questions which asked about what would Begin's attitude be towards annexation and the Trump plan. And a second one, which is somewhat related, which is what would, what would he think about the current direction of the Likud party? Oh, okay. So the first one, the quick answer is, I don't know. And the quick answer to the second one is, I do know. Uh, but now let me say just a little bit more about each of those. Uh, what he would do about annexation, and look, here's how much we don't know what Begin would have done, because we still don't even know what Bibi's going to do. I mean, just keep that in mind. I mean, everybody on this call, everybody probably has an opinion, because we're Jews, most of us probably, uh, so if everybody has an opinion and is sure that they're right, but nobody actually knows what Bibi's going to do. Uh, so if we don't know what Bibi's going to do when he's alive and well and you know, wearing a mask, uh, how should we possibly know what Menachem Begin would have done? Uh, back in you know ninety two or when he was when he was ninety one or prime minister when he was not you know until eighty two, we don't really know. I mean I think but here you have to understand here you really have to consider what um, Yechiel Kadeshai said to me. Of course Menachem Begin said he would never create a Palestinian state, and that's why some of the settlers, as they're called in the international press, today say they are actually opposed to the Trump plan. They are opposed to annexation because if annexation and don't forget Rivlin uses that word. It's not a dirty word. Rivlin cares a lot about Israel and uses the word annexation. So let's just use that word and make it simple, as opposed to the gradual extension of Israeli sovereignty over whatever, it just take all night. But, um, but you know, it's really impossible to know. I mean, we don't know what, Bebe, we don't know what Bibi's going to do. We see that some of the settlers are opposed to it. Um, and, uh, they're opposed to it because they also are opposed to a Palestinian state, and therefore they say, say to Trump, no deal. Now, I think Bibi is very nervous about saying to Trump, no deal, because Trump doesn't like to be told no deal. Um, so I don't know what Begin would have done. Um, what I can say is this, I would have, if, if the annexation was part of a peace deal with the Palestinians, I might wager that he would have perhaps gone ahead and done it. Um, if it's not part of a peace deal with the Palestinians and the creation of a Palestinian state comes without a signed treaty, my instinct is that he would not have done it he would just say no to the plan. My instinct is he would say no to the annexation and no to the Palestinian state 
we'll keep the status quo, but I have no idea. And anybody who thinks they know doesn't know. Um, you know, Benny may have his own ideas what his father might have done, but even Benny, of course, was just a person who doesn't know what was in his father's head. So we don't know. What I can tell you this without any doubt whatsoever is that Menachem Begin would be appalled by what's happened to the Likud party, appalled. Uh, and people have said, including Benny Begin, have said to Bibi that you are not an heir to the Likud party. I mean, there are many reasons for that. One of them is that this current Likud party has exactly zero social agenda. Now, we didn't get a chance to talk about Menachem Begin's social agenda of urban renewal and of greater rights for Mizrahim and so on and so forth. But Menachem Begin was brought to power by Israel's poor uh, because they knew that he cared about them. Menachem Begin, um, you know, there was, not a, there was not a racist bone in his body. He's the one who began the Ethiopian immigration, even though it became much more pronounced under uh, Shamir. Um, so the current Likud party, first of all, has no, no glimmer of a, social, of a social agenda. So Begin would have found that appalling. Uh, Israel has poor people. Israel has Holocaust survivors living under the poverty line. Israel has now many, many, many unemployed people. Uh, he would have been appalled. But even more than that, look, Menachem Begin, when Menachem Begin left office in 1982, he moved in with his daughter, Leah. He moved in with his daughter, Leah, not because he was afraid of living alone. He moved in with his daughter, Leah, because he had nowhere else to live. He had no money. He didn't own an apartment. He didn't own a house. He had no money he saved up. He'd given away all the money from the, Nobel, uh, from the Nobel Prize to create other prizes that are still being given out in Israel. He had nowhere to go. He was the prime minister of the state of Israel and he had nowhere to go. So he moved in with his daughter. During all of the years that he was the head of the opposition, he would often take the bus from their apartment at one Rosenbaum in Tel Aviv. Their apartment in Tel Aviv, they had three kids, two daughters and a son who were teenagers, like all other teenagers. It was a one bedroom apartment. All three kids slept in one bedroom, even when he was the head of the opposition. And he and Eliza had an L-shaped sofa. You can actually see it at the baking center. It's all there, I imagine, all right? Um, they had this L-shaped sofa that at night they would just push together and make a bed out of it. I mean, that's how we lived. The idea that you would spend $40,000 to put a bed into a plane for a five-hour flight from Ben Gurion to Heathrow would have struck him as appalling. Uh, and again, you know, most of the most of the Israeli press is not debating whether or not Bibi Netanyahu is guilty of something illegal. The only question is whether or not it merits removing him from office. Uh, but Begin was squeaky clean, uh, so I think the combination of uh, the lack of a social agenda, the lack of the transparency that characterized Begin, uh, he would not be happy about what happened to the Likud party. By the way, I mean, Ben-Gurion, leaving aside the fact that the Labour Party hardly gets any votes, leaving that completely aside, David Ben-Gurion wouldn't be very happy with what's happened to the, um, the Labour Party either. To say nothing, you know, that the, 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 the originators of the Mafdal Party, which doesn't even exist, uh, would be very distressed to see what's happened to their inheritors in various parties of the national religious movement. So look, parties do change. Um, I'm not sure that Abraham Lincoln would be, Abraham Lincoln, of course, was a Republican. I'm not entirely certain that he'd be thrilled with the Republican Party today. We're not going to get into American politics, but one could make such an argument, it seems to me, in a plausible kind of a way. So um, I think he would be very unhappy with the Likud, what he would do about annexation. At the end of the day, you can only quote Yechiel Kadeshai, Emli Musag. Okay, thank you very much. Um, th there were a couple of questions about Begin's relationships with other people. One about um, uh, what's your view on the differences between Begin and Jabotinsky? Were they tactical or ideological? And if the latter, what was the core of the differences? And a second question was about his relationship with Yitzhak Shamir. Ah, okay. Um, his, his relationship with Yitzhak Shamir was, was, was basically okay. In other words, they both ran different uh, undergraduate organizations, uh, undergraduate, underground organizations. What happens, you work in a college, and even say underground, you say undergraduate. But uh, different underground organizations pre-state. Uh, he had his differences, obviously, with the policies of the Lehi, which was much more willing to kill civilians than the Irgun, which tried very hard never to kill civilians. They did kill some civilians, but not intentionally. Um, but he didn't have any personal animosity for Yitzhak Shamir. Um, there's no reason to think that he did. They disagreed about certain things. They collided periodically, but it was not one of those relationships that were really fraught with animosity, like his relationship with Ben-Gurion or his relationship with Jimmy Carter, who he despised. 
uh, and was convinced that at his very core was a full-blown anti-Semite. And here I will say that I think Menachem Begin was 100% correct. Um, but nonetheless, there were, there were relationships with people that we know that he had terrible relationships with. He had other relationships that were warm friendships, but then had a falling out with those people. Uh, some of them, cats among others, when cats did not support his, um, his, his vote in Knesset to get to pull out of the Sinai and to sign a deal with Egypt. Uh, he saw that as a, as a great personal kind of uh, disloyalty. And it was only at the very end of their their lives when uh, they were both very feeble, that they got together at one point to sit on a park bench together and talk to each other. Cats couldn't hear, they were writing notes. But I mean, that relationship was fraught towards the end. He did not have a fraught relationship with, with Shamir at all. The relationship with Jabotinsky, look, some of it is what happens when the student reaches the rank of the teacher. I mean, we all know, leaving aside the question for a moment of whether it was tactical or ideological, there is always in those relationships where the disciple becomes the master, uh, those relationships always become fraught, you know, whether they're in the academic world in which somebody, you know, does a doctorate with somebody, but then they become the big name in the field even more than their doctoral advisor. Those relationships are very complicated. You see it in the medical world. You see it all over, even in the political world. Um, and I think that a large measure of it was that Jabotinsky understood that in one way it was extraordinarily wonderful that he had found a disciple who was going to take revisionist Zionism even further. But Jabotinsky was an unparalleled genius. I mean, he translated Shakespeare into Yiddish and Bialik into Russian. I mean, he was an unbelievable intellect. Um, and to see somebody in his own lifetime uh, sort of begin to take the spotlight I think was difficult for him. I think also, don't forget that Jabotinsky was exiled from Palestine uh, by the British. So eventually, um, you know, he really can't even become a player in Palestine. Uh, he dies before Menachem Begin gets to Palestine, but um, he dies in 1940 on Long Island. But um, so some of it was that, but I think some of it was ideological. I think Begin was uh, of a different sort. Jabotinsky had not grown up in the home, like a home that Begin had grown up in with a lack of patience of waiting for the world. Uh, it was clear to Begin where Europe was headed. A lot, I mean, Jabotinsky also told Europeans to get out. But I think it was more than tactical. I think it was ideological to a certain extent as well. But a good part of it was just simply what happens when the disciple begins to become the master. Um, those tensions often come to the surface. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to take one last question, I think. Um, okay. So uh, Avner Falk asks about uh, reports or research um, referring to Begin having some sort of depression or mood swings. Is that something that you came across? Yeah. Um, there is actually one biography. There's been a number of biographies written about Menachem Begin. Uh, one of them, I forget the name off the top of my head, uh, but was written 20, 30 years ago, uh, actually is a kind of a psychological psychobiography. I'm not personally a big fan of psychobiographies in general. Uh, I think they miss a huge part of the story, but there is absolutely no question. Uh, that Menachem Begin battled depression. Whether you'd call it clinical depression these days or not, I don't know, I'm not a psychiatrist, um, but there's no question that he had very dark periods. In fact, when he was called back to political life during the period at the beginning of the reparations, he had gone out somewhere near Shoresh, you know, outside of Jerusalem, rented a small place to, to work on a, on a book, uh, but he was also taking some time out from the battered life of political life uh, there were certain periods in his life, and it, you know, it happened later on in life as well, where a certain darkness came over him. Uh, I don't personally believe that it inhibited his ability to function. I don't believe that he made any bad decisions that you could point to because of that. Uh, but there's no question that the people, who, um, the people who knew him and knew him well understood very well that this was a man who had, uh, like any single one of us, you know, on my screen now, there's 25 different windows. Uh, and some of them have more than one person. Um, so what, the 25, 30 people on this window, <clears throat> on this screen, none of us live lives without our demons. We all have better periods and worse periods. His darker periods might have been darker than some other people's periods, perhaps. Uh, his passionate periods were absolutely more passionate than most of our passionate periods. Um, so yes, he had those dark periods, but I try very hard in the book, even though I mentioned them, not to let them color the way that we think about him. I think that would be unfair. I think the way to think about him is a person of tremendous intellectual power, a person of tremendous pathos, and a person of tremendous passion. 
uh, who's, the story of whose life is really the story in many ways of the first several decades of the state of Israel. And you know, all those what if questions about history are really not worth asking because nobody knows what if. Uh, but he was the right man at the right time. Is there anybody else uh, who could have made an argument for, against reparations the way that he did, accept defeat, and still have emblazoned on Israel's soul a kind of uh, a, a, a commitment to Jewish memory the way that he did? I don't think so. Is there anybody else that could have signed the Egyptian peace treaty? Probably not, because as people on the right always point out, the left can never do it because the right will always block it. If the right tries to do it, what's the left going to do? Block it? Uh, there's only one person in Israel at that point who could have made a deal with Egypt. Uh, and I'll remind you that during the war in 2014, Israel had one major ally in the entire world, and it was not the United States. It was Egypt. And if somebody had said to you in 1977, 78, 79, when the whole negotiation is going on, the day is going to come in 2014 that Israel is going to have one major ally in the world that's going to be Egypt, people would have said, you're out of your mind. Um, but that's, that's what happened. Now, did Benachem Begin expect that? I'm sure he didn't expect that. But he believed in the possibility of peace, and no one else could possibly have done that. Uh, would Menachem Begin, have, would anybody else have been willing to take the risks that O.C. Rock and destroying the Iraq nuclear reactor entailed? I don't know, but I'll, I'll end with it. He was a man of, of tremendous complexity and tremendous nuance. And so everybody always wanted to know, you know, like, does Menachem Begin really believe that God runs history? Or is he kind of more of a secularist who believes that people run history? And when the pilots all came back from O.C. Rock and every single one of them had landed safely, including Ilan Ramon, who would tragically die in the space shuttle accident, but was the last of the eight others to, to land. Uh, people ran up to him and asked him a day or two later, so was this God or was this Tzahal? And his response was, thank God we have pilots like this. In other words, he escaped the question. He showed his deep found belief in God. He showed his perennial belief in the incredible power of the Israeli military and his belief in the sanctity of the Jewish state. Uh, and if we could clone him, we'd be very fortunate indeed. Thanks for joining and have a good evening or afternoon or morning wherever you might find yourselves. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. You can only hear me clapping because everyone is on mute, but they are also <laughs> clapping. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, everyone on the call, um, that was a uh, really incredibly high, uh, high standard that we've set for the rest of these, uh, for the rest of these Prime Minister lectures. Um, you'll all hear from me in the next couple of days with details about next week's lecture on Yitzhak Rabin. Please join us for that as well. And uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining us. And uh, as, as Daniel Gorda said, good evening or good afternoon or good morning. And thank you very much. Bye. Take care.